you're speeding along a track at 90 miles per hour while being chased by those vindictive villains again. And now they have you cornered. What do you do? Your only option is up and out, right? Just like the movies. You'll run along the rooftop, perhaps battle a baddie or two, and escape to another train car. But is it actually possible to run on the roof of a speeding train and leap from carriage to carriage, evading those evildoers? Or as you jump and your feet leave the surface, will the train simply pass by underneath you while you're in the air, meaning you'd land behind where you jumped from? Worse still, would you miss your mark entirely and tumble down between the cars because the gap is moving forward too? Let's find out. I'm Stu, this is Debunked, and we're here to talk the truths from the myths and the facts from the misconceptions. The train top fistfight is an action movie staple. More than 120 years ago, enwrapped cinema audiences watched on with bated breath as a silent black and white scuffle unfolded atop a decidedly low speed locomotive in 1903's 12 minute thriller The Great Train Robbery. Over the course of the 20th century, the movie industry continued to up the ante, increasing the speed of the trains and the complexity of the fight choreography, alongside huge advances in the level of stunts and special effects. But could a real-life James Bond really jump cat-like between carriages with relative ease? Is what we all see in Mission Impossible possible? Or would they all join Wolverine and become X-Men? Before we go all out and risk our hapless hero's neck on top of a speeding bullet train, we'll take things down a notch. Let's see how he fares in a more familiar setting, inside a train carriage. Moving at a steady 90 miles or 145 kilometers per hour, typical of an intercity train service. Picture yourself on the moving train. You're on a stretch of dead straight track, and for the purpose of this thought experiment, the train is moving at a steady speed, and the carriage isn't wobbling or juddering like a carriage so often does. In this scenario, the train is moving, obviously, but you're sitting still. But what's the truth? Are you stationary, no pun intended, or moving at 90 miles per hour? I'm afraid the answer is a sneaky third option. It depends on who you ask. Relative to the guy in the seat behind you, you're stationary. Relative to the train spotter you just whizzed past, you're moving at the same speed as the train. Basically, it depends on your frame of reference, or to use the proper physics term, the inertial reference frame of the observer. An inertial reference frame is one in which objects either stay at rest or move at a constant speed in a straight line unless acted upon by an external force. In other words, no acceleration is involved. So, if you jump in the air inside the train carriage, you're introducing an upward force. Does the train move forward underneath you so that you land further back in the carriage? No. According to you and your fellow passengers, you are also moving with the train. You don't move backwards or forwards. You jump upwards and land on exactly the same spot on the floor of the train carriage. Relative to the train spotter though, as well as moving upwards and back down again, your airborne body, already moving at the speed of the train, continues to move forward at 90 miles per hour. So far, so good. But let's take things up top and see how we get on on the roof. As we've already established, you're moving at the same speed, in the same direction as the train. So if you jump straight upwards on the roof, you should come back down in the same spot, right? Unfortunately, on the roof, it's a bit more complicated. When you're inside the carriage, the walls, windows, and roof of the train form a sort of protective shell, regardless of what's going on outside of the train. The experience isn't wildly different to that of sitting in your living room. Stood on the roof of a moving train, though, even on a perfectly still day, you would experience air resistance. Air resistance, or drag, is the force caused by air molecules colliding with a moving object, acting in opposition to the object's direction of motion. Does that mean that if you are somehow able to jump straight up in the air, you'd be shifted further back? Yes. The considerable drag force would decelerate your body in its horizontal direction of travel, while the train would continue to speed forward at 90 miles per hour. And I'm afraid it gets worse. But before we get into that, let's get ourselves out of the wind and back inside the carriage. We've got some sensitive material on our phone that these bad guys are after and that you need to upload. But the security on the public Wi-Fi service simply isn't going to cut it. 
Let's use Surfshark to log on, using one of their generated alternate IDs and numbers. That'll keep your identity protected. Then we'll use the VPN to encrypt your data while you're online, keeping your information safe and secure. Using a VPN will also keep your location anonymous and pretty much keep you invisible online. Phew! Now that's uploaded, we can now get on with surfing the internet with the clean web feature. That will remove ads, stop trackers and prevent phishing attempts. And while we're at it, let's take advantage of the incogni feature to get our personal data removed from data broker lists and stop our information being sold. Nice. If you'd like to take advantage of all this too, try out Surfshark by clicking on my link in the description, surfshark.com forward slash debunked official, and get yourself four extra months on top of the annual subscription. Right, now let's find out how our hero stick is getting on up top. The drag force on the roof of a moving train at intercity speeds would make even standing upright very difficult. On our hypothetical still day, meaning we don't need to consider crosswinds, the drag force would essentially feel like a 90 mile per hour headwind. That sort of wind speed is equivalent to a category 1 hurricane, which according to the Saffir Simpson hurricane wind scale is unlikely to cause structural damage. But can uproot trees and cause some flooding in coastal areas. Absolutely not conducive to a precarious battle on a camber roof. For the sake of rigor, let's take a closer look at the forces involved. The size of the force due to drag depends on a few things. The most commonly used equation contains terms for air density, the cross-sectional area of the moving object, in this case your body standing face on, velocity squared, essentially the speed of travel multiplied by itself, and a drag coefficient, a term that tells you how smoothly an object passes through the air, which depends on the object's surface texture, shape, and orientation. As we mentioned, a person standing on the roof of a moving train will be moving at the speed of the train, 90 miles per hour, which is 145 kilometers per hour, or just over 40 meters per second. Rudely assuming your cross-sectional surface area to be about 0.7 meters squared, we get a drag force value that's a bit more than 690 newtons. To get a rough idea of how big this force is, let's see how it compares to the downward force acting on your body due to gravity. Well, again, just as rudely, assuming you weigh in at about 75 kilograms or 165 pounds, you're looking at just over 735 newtons. So, what determines whether you're able to stay put? Well, a strong wind on a train roof could essentially take you out in one of two ways. It can tip you over or it can make you slide backwards. Toppling happens when a force tilts your body so that your weight shifts beyond your feet, which act as your base of support. Once that happens, you lose your balance and down you go. Anyone who's taken a walk on a very windy day knows that there's really only one way to stop yourself from toppling when you're reckoning with a forceful wind blowing in your direction. Lean forward hard. So, what sort of angle would we need to shift our center of balance sufficiently far forward to counter the push from the drag on top of our speeding train? Well, we've run the numbers and it doesn't look good. Only a couple of degrees short of 45 from the vertical. Let's face it, that's not practical. To make matters worse, even if you could lean that far, the frictional force provided by even the most sturdy pair of rubber-soled boots isn't going to be anywhere near big enough to stop you from sliding backwards in the face of a 90 miles or 145 kilometer per hour headwind. If you couldn't manage to even stand up on the roof of a regular intercity service, Wolverine's full-on rumble on the roof of a 200 mile per hour or 320 kilometer per hour bullet train with the Yakuza is quite obviously impossible. Impossible scenes like this are usually shot in a studio, on green screen, and with CGI. Just to give you a rough idea of what the latter scenario might be like, the headwind you'd experience due to air resistance on the top of a bullet train hurtling towards its destination at top speed would be so strong that it would feel like you were being battered by a Category 5 hurricane, which, according to the Saffir Simpson hurricane wind scale, looks like this. Catastrophic. 
buildings destroyed with small buildings being overturned, all trees and signs blown down, evacuation of up to 10 miles inland. Hardly optimal conditions for a scrap. And just to really bring it down to earth, the wind speed in an indoor skydiving wind tunnel starts at about 120 miles or 190 kilometers per hour, and usually maxes out at 200 miles or 320 kilometers per hour. At this point in particular, this goon would have taken off from the roof like a kite. What about the scenario that plays out in Mission Impossible? If we were to lay down on the roof of our train, would we be able to crawl around? Lying flat on your stomach, perhaps head and shoulders slightly raised, elbows in an army crawl position, obviously means that a far small fraction of your body is presented to the oncoming air drastically reducing drag. If we go with about 0.2 meters squared for your cross-sectional area, we get a drag force closer to 70 newtons. This is less than a tenth of the 735 newton downward force of your weight. The friction between the underside of your body and the roof of the train should be enough to keep you anchored. So, what's the verdict on this one? This scenario is a lot more feasible, but you'd be wise to stay low and slow. Again, not much room for violence here. It looks like high-speed trains are out. How about something more middling, speed-wise? Let's take to the top of a freight train, a popular choice of many a blockbuster. A train like this might trundle along at something closer to 50 miles per hour, or 80 kilometers per hour. How would our hero get on under these conditions? Well, at 50 miles per hour, the air resistance would feel like standing in a strong gale, which, according to the Beaufort wind scale, reaches wind force 9 out of a possible 12, and looks like this on land. Slight structural damage occurs, slate blows off roofs. Again, we've run some numbers, and the drag force is close to 200 newtons, less than a third of that on top of the high-speed train. Leaning at an angle closer to 15 degrees from the vertical, you should be able to remain standing. Fighting, though, is another thing entirely. All I want is to fight on the top of a train! Is that too much to ask? Anyone who's actually tried to get from one end of a carriage to the other on an intercity service will tell you it's not as simple as it looks. The rails are not always dead level. And unless you're on the Trans-Australian Railway, railway tracks are very rarely dead straight. There are also almost always crosswinds, and as we discussed earlier, the carriages have a tendency to wobble. In addition, sudden motions like swinging a punch or drawing a weapon would drastically increase drag and suddenly change your cross-sectional area, such that keeping your balance would be impossible. Another scenario for the not feasible pile. Okay, no fighting for now then. How about a spot of running with a side order of jumping? Unfortunately, the same logic applies. With your 15 degree lean locked in, you might just manage the world's most awkward slow shuffle. But any dramatic changes to your precariously maintained state of balance, obviously a requirement if you want to get a jog on, would send you tumbling. As for jumping, if you are somehow athletic enough to launch yourself upwards from a 15 degree leaning angle with a 50 mile per hour drag on you, you would immediately forfeit the frictional force between your shoes and the train's roof that was keeping you rooted. The drag force would slow the forward motion of your airborne body while the train continued to rattle forwards. A very awkward landing and a disastrous tumble is almost certain. These sorts of scenes are either filmed with trains traveling at much lower speeds, or not even moving at all. So, what else could we clamber aboard for our celluloid scrap? Well, this particular movie trope started with locomotives from the golden age of steam. And there are plenty of examples from silent comedies at the dawn of cinema to modern reimaginings of classic westerns. Most US passenger trains of this era wouldn't have traveled at more than 20 to 30 miles per hour or 30 to 50 kilometers per hour. So, how would our hero fare upon the rolling stock of the Wild West? A lot better. At 25 miles per hour, the drag force would be equivalent to what the US Weather Service would classify as a strong breeze. According to the Beaufort wind scale, this would rank in at level 6, and the extent of damage and destruction we're looking at here is... Large branches sway, umbrellas difficult to use. Not the sort of thing you'd usually brandish in a fight to the death. 
so you're safe there. If you think back to the last time you experienced umbrellas difficult to use weather, you'll realise we don't need complex mathematical modelling to get to the core of the issue. Could you fight under these conditions? For sure, though you might wobble a bit. Could you jump over an approaching object as it passed over the train roof? Nowhere near safe, but certainly possible. But in this scenario, Bond should have just ducked. What about jumping between carriages? The distance between actual carriages on a steam locomotive is generally of the order of a few feet, sometimes less. A pretty easy distance to clear for anyone with even a basic level of fitness, so it's definitely doable. Should you try? Very obviously not under any circumstances whatsoever. There's absolutely no reason to ever get on top of a moving train. Okay, wait, what if there's a helicopter? Ooh, yeah, or a dragon. Ooh, yeah, or some sarcasm. Ooh, yeah, or hang on. What? <laughs> for the sake of our thought experiment, though, does it make a difference which direction you choose for your running jump? It certainly does. Running in the direction of travel vastly increases drag. However, running in the opposite direction, i.e. towards the rear of the train, means the air isn't hampering your progress by pushing against you, making it easier for you to run and jump. Just make sure you slow down before the end. Oh, stick. Thanks for watching, and don't forget to try out Surfshark and some of its amazing features. Plus, they offer a 30-day money-back guarantee. Stay safe, and we'll see you next time.